Hey kiddos, so this is Miss Lumpkins, and today we're going to be doing our reading for the DVQ that we're going to be doing. So we're going to be looking at the cotton gin and how it changes the economy of the South. Alright, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to zoom in a little bit more so I can see it more clearly. Um, so we're talking about the cotton gin and how the cotton gin shaped Georgia's economy. So the cotton has always played an important role in both the history and economy of Georgia. By 1820, Georgia was the world's leading producer of cotton. On the eve of the Civil War in 1861, cotton exports from the southern United States were twice that of the rest of the world. Cotton was indeed king, but that had not always been the case. All right. Um, so I, so what we know is that in 1861, right, cotton exports were twice that of the rest of the world. So exports, remember, is just the stuff that is leaving that region. So that's what they're selling. So we're going to highlight that and um, I'm feeling a nice little maroon today. Um, so in 1861, cotton exports in the southern United States were twice that of the world, and um, we know this, um, they called Cotton King, I'm going to go ahead and underline that, um, but cotton wasn't always like that, so it was really, really, it was doing really, really well, <clears throat> but it wasn't always like that. So in 1790, the only profitable cotton growth in the United States was the long staple variety grown on the sea islands off the coasts of South Carolina and Georgia. Sea island cotton produced a long, strong fiber that was easily separated from the seed, but sea island cotton could only be grown along the coast. Short staple cotton grew inland, but its fibers covered the entire seed, making it difficult to separate. Short staple cotton could only be separated by hand, which was slow and inefficient. <clears throat> okay, so we know that in 1790, right, um, the only profitable cotton, the only profitable cotton was the long staple variety, right? So you own the only one that was actually like would make you a lot of money was this long staple. And this long staple um means that it produced a long strong fiber that was easily separated from the seed. So it was really easy to get rid of the seeds and and like cultivate this this little crop. However, it could only be grown um along the coast. So if you were inland uh, you could not really uh, use this. So what they grew instead was that short staple cotton, <clears throat> right? So we have our short staple cotton. And that short staple cotton, um, it's kind of like the long staple cotton, but its fibers are covered uh, the entire seed, making it difficult to separate, right? <clears throat> so when we say that cotton was very labor intensive, like it took a lot of work um, it's because of this right and it could only be separated by hand which was slow and inefficient so it wasn't very fast it wasn't you couldn't do a lot at one time and that's your short staple cotton <clears throat> all right so most Georgians at the beginning of the 19th century lived in or near cities of savannah and augusta along the savannah river uh, with populations growing farmers began moving westward drawn to rich soil of interior georgia However, cotton was still too labor-intensive to be profitable. With Georgia's tobacco industry in decline, a new technology was desperately needed for short staple cotton. All right, so we know that most Georgians, right, most of these Georgians, they live, uh, they live near the cities of um, these, these two cities. Um, which is along the Savannah River. Um, but while our, with our populations growing, farmers began to move westward. So they're not staying by the coast anymore, which is where our long staple cotton grew. So they're gonna have to um, grow a different type of cotton. We know that cotton is still labor intensive. It takes a long time to cultivate it to get rid of the seeds in that short staple because that's what they have to be doing since they're farther away from the coast 
Um, so we know that a new technology is desperately needed. So I'm just going to go ahead and underline that. So we know that it's desperately needed. We need this. Um, we need a new technology to make this more efficient because right now it is not efficient. So the new technology came from an unlikely source. Eli Whitney was born in Massachusetts in 1765. His father was a farmer with a small manufacturing business on the side. In this shop, Eli learned mechanics. By age 14, he ran a profitable uh, nail manufacturing business. All right, I'm just going to highlight Eli Whitney. The, the rest of this uh, is just like his life before he makes this. Um, so we know he was born in Massachusetts. He's from the north. He was a, um, a farmer, but they had a manufacturing business because remember, farms don't do so well in the north. Um, so he knows all about manufacturing. In 1793, 10 years after the Revolutionary War, Whitney left the north and set sail to work as a tutor on a plantation in South Carolina. There, he saw cotton growing for the first time and devoted himself to finding a way to gin the fibers. In a letter to his father, he wrote that if a machine could be invented which would clean the cotton with expedition, it would be a great thing both to the country and the inventor. All right, so we know that in 1793, right, um, he is going... Whitney um, is going to go to South Carolina, right? And that is where a lot of um, our plantations are in growing. He, so he's going to see cotton growing for the very first time, and he's going to devote himself to finding a way to gin the fibers. Uh, when we say gin the fibers, what we mean is separate those fibers from the seed. Right, so that's why it's called cotton gin because it separates the fibers from the seed. So in a letter to his father, he wrote that if a machine could be invented um, which would clean uh, the cotton with expedition, it would be a great thing for both the country and the inventor. He wants to find a way to gin these fibers quickly and efficiently. Right, so Whitney's cotton gin was simple. Wire hooks attached to a cylinder pulled cotton through a mesh screen. Because the seeds could not pass through this filter, fibers were easily separated. His device allowed a person to clean 50 pounds of cotton per day rather than just one pound. Right, so we're like going like, like more than, more than double, like five times as many stuff as you can do before this machine. Um, so growing cotton was still labor intensive, but the labor shifted from ginning to growing and picking the cotton, right? So we know that this cotton gin was simple, right? And it tells us exactly how it works, right? Um, so this all right here, I'm just going to underline it because this all tells us how it works. Okay, so you have a little cylinder. We see it right here in this picture. You grind this gear. It pulls the fibers from the seeds. And so his device is, this is important. It, a person can clean 50 pounds of cotton per day instead of just one pound. So what that does is it changes everything. This is the game changer right here for the South. Um, so now cotton is still labor intensive but the labor is shifted from ginning the cotton to, which means, remember, separating those fibers. It's now, the labor-intensive part is now the growing and the picking of the cotton, right? So we know that it is um, still labor-intensive. Let me go ahead and highlight that too because that is important. So it's still labor-intensive. It takes a lot of manpower and a lot of work in order to get it done, but it's no longer the ginning, the separating, it's now the growing and the picking, that's the labor intensive part. So Eli Whitney never made much money from his cotton gin. Its simple design made it easy to uh, copy, uh, to copy, right? So between 1794 and 1803, nine patents uh, for improvements to the gin were granted to people other than Whitney. And remember, patents is one of our vocab words. Um, that means uh, that he, uh, patents is like permission from the government in order to make something, to have sole rights over an invention. Um, 
And so improvements to the gin were granted to people other than Whitney. And in 1812, Whitney's own application for the renewal of his cotton gin patent was denied by the U.S. government. So we know that Eli Whitney, he never made any, any money off of this machine. So it was revolutionary, but, you know, he didn't get to reap the benefits of it because it was so simple. So throughout the history, inventions and new technologies have changed the way humans live. Perhaps no other development affected life in the South and in Georgia in the first half of the 19th century more than the cotton gin. Its impact was far-reaching. This mini Q asks you to examine the economic effects of the cotton gin and answer the question, how did the cotton gin shape Georgia's economy? All right, so we know that... Um, this right here, um, right here, that there's no other development affected the lives. So this cotton gin changed everything for the South. Like, I mean, it was a game changer. It's like, like getting something so obvious, uh, but you never thought of it before. Like it just changes everything for them. Um, so we know that we are going to examine the economic effects. So how does this change the economy of the South? And it does by a lot. And then this is our question that we're going to answer. And I'm going to go ahead and highlight that in a different color. Um, well, let's go with purple. Um, so how did the cotton gin shape Georgia's economy? So the things that you are looking at, um, the two things that you are going to be looking at is our economic um effects and it's going to do one of two things right it's going to um it's going to increase oh 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 there we go sometimes that happens and i don't know why all right it's going to increase the, um cotton production so the amount of cotton that we're doing is going to increase and the second thing that this is going to do is expand slavery in the south um, so your two documents that you're going to look at what you're going to look at one today and one tomorrow the two documents that you're going to look at are going to talk about these two things so just keep that in mind these are your economic effects all right um so i will see you all next time all right bye